If you have ever thought about starting your own podcast, you should check out Riverside. Riverside is an online recording studio that lets you record podcasts and video in studio quality from anywhere. And if you click on the affiliated link in the episode description and you buy a subscription, you will also be supporting the podcast. And if you're going to start your own podcast or you just want to continue to listen to great podcasts, you need headphones or speakers. If you click on the Amazon affiliated link, you can get great deals on headphones and speakers. And if you make a purchase, it will also help support the podcast. Both links will be in the episode description if you are interested. If there is one takeaway I want you to have after this episode of History Shelf is over, it is just how destructive the act of othering is. This story I have to tell you this week is an excellent example of that. This story is about a man that believed that the subject of this week's episode was a woman that was beneath him, and she had reached far too high, and it was his duty to knock her back into her place, no matter what the cost. So when he called her a witch, what he was really trying to say to her was, your kind does not belong here. And what he meant by your kind was, poor people. Hi, I'm Courtney Jewell, and you are listening to the third episode of the second season of History Shelf, a podcast about history that proves that sometimes fact is even more interesting than fiction. For the second season of History Shelf, I have chosen to title this season, Something Wicked This Way Comes. You may know that that comes from the William Shakespeare play, Macbeth. I am going to be talking about each week this season, about someone from history that was accused of witchcraft. But as we go along, you will find that the wicked I am referring to is not the ones that were accused, but rather the accusers. You will find that those accused were not obviously actually witches, but victims of people that were out for revenge and personal gain and those caught up in the hysteria of it all. And for this week, I am talking about Agnes Bernauer. This story has to first start out with some background information. This story takes place in Bavaria in the 15th century, long before Germany actually became Germany. During this time, Bavaria was broken up into three. Munich, Landshut, and Ingolstadt. It had been that way since 1375. A man by the name Ernest of Bavaria Munich plays an important role in this story. Ernest came from the house of Wittelsbach, and he ruled the Duchy of Munich with his younger brother, William III. Ernest had big dreams for his only son, Albert III. He dreamt that his son would rule all of Bavaria one day. It was a dream that Ernest sincerely believed was achievable. None of Ernest's cousins had any male heirs. It was quite possible that his son would rule all of Bavaria. Ernest knew his son had to marry, and he had to marry well. Ernest was first engaged to a noblewoman, Elizabeth of Wittenberg in 1429, but they were never married because she eloped with a page at her father's court by the name of Count John IV of Wittenberg. By 1432, Albert was still unmarried. Ernest urged his son to find a bride, and soon Albert would fall madly in love. Now the story brings us to the leading lady of this week's episode, Agnes Bernauer. On this podcast, like I've said before, I like to tell you everything I can about the subject of each episode. I start with their birth and I end the episode with their death. 
And I love to tell you all the stuff in between. I would love to do that with Agnes, but unfortunately that just isn't an option. Little is known about Agnes's early life, but I will tell you what is known. Agnes was probably born around 1410. Her mother is unknown, but it's possible that her father was a barber surgeon named Caspar Bernauer from Augsburg. Caspar owned a bathhouse, which is possibly responsible for Agnes and Albert's worlds colliding. Albert participated in a nightly tournament in Oxford in February 1428. When I say nightly, I mean nightly spelled K-N-I-G-H-T-L-Y. After one of the nightly games Albert participated in, he went to go relax at Casper's bathhouse. Bathhouses were quite popular in the Middle Ages. At a bathhouse, you could wash, get massaged, or get medicated by a pool attendant. Prostitutes also often frequent the bathhouses. Agnes wasn't a prostitute, but it was at Casper's bathhouse where Agnes and Albert probably met. Albert was taken with Agnes. She was beautiful. Agnes had blonde hair and was about 17 or 18 years old at the time. Albert was 27 years old. The two became a couple and fell in love that year. In a Munich tax roll in 1428, there is a heroine listed as a member of Albert's royal household. That was probably Agnes. In the summer of 1432, at the latest, Agnes was a vital part of Munich court. Albert was completely in love with Agnes. By this time, it is possible that Agnes and Albert were married, although there is no proof of a wedding ceremony between the two ever taking place. It might also be possible that Agnes and Albert shared a daughter named Sibylla. She was possibly born within the first year of Agnes and Albert's romance, but it is also possible that they were childless. Agnes became a part of court life in Munich, but not everyone at court was smitten with her. Albert's sister, Palatine Countess Beatrix, was annoyed with Agnes's self-assured attitude. Albert's sister wasn't the only one at court that thought that Agnes had no right to be there. Albert's father believed that Agnes was beneath his son. His son could possibly be the ruler of all Bavaria. Albert needed to marry a woman that was his equal, and in the eyes of Ernest, Duke of Bavaria, a daughter of a barber surgeon that his son met in a bathhouse, was not the proper woman his son should marry. But Albert did not care about his father's opinions on Agnes. He loved her, and that was all that mattered to him. Albert began to rebel against his father. In 1433, Albert moved Agnes in Straubing, where Albert ruled, and he treated Agnes as his duchess. Ernest was beyond angry with his only son when he told him that he was actually married to Agnes. Ernest believed that Albert had gone too far. He needed to do something. Agnes would not be the wife of the future Duke of Bavaria. On October 12, 1435, Albert went hunting with one of his relatives, Henry of Bavaria Lansut. Ernest took this opportunity to get rid of what he saw was a stain on the house of Wittelsbach. Ernest had Agnes arrested for witchcraft. She most likely was found guilty without a trial. Ernest ordered for her to be pushed off a bridge into the Danube River in Straubing. Agnes hit the water and she used her foot that was not bound to swim for her life. She came close to the shore. As she swam to the shore, she cried out for help with her hoarse voice, but no one came to her aid. Her executioner worried as he watched her get closer and closer to the shore. Ernest did not want Agnes to survive, and the executioner feared what Ernest would do to him if he came back to him and told him that he had not done his job. 
So Agnes's executioner ran along the riverbank and wrapped a pole in Agnes's hair and pressed her head into the river. There in the Danube River, Agnes died. She was approximately 25 years old. As I'm sure you can imagine, the tension between Albert and his father was high. Albert left and went to Ingolstadt to stay with Ernest's cousin and rival, Louis VII, Duke of Bavaria Ingolstadt, and many feared that Albert was going to go to war with his father. But after a few months, Albert reconciled with his father and married Anna of Brunswick Grubenhagen Einbeck without war breaking out. But even though Albert married again and had ten children with his second wife, he still remembered his first love. In December of 1435, Albert endowed a perpetual mass and an annual memorial celebration in Straubing in Agnes's memory. In 1447, he expanded that endowment. Ernest had Agnes Bernauer Chapel erected in 1436 in the cemetery of St. Peter in Straubing. It was probably an attempt to please his son and not out of guilt for being responsible for her death. In the chapel named after her is where her remains were put to rest. Her tombstone that is made out of red marble is almost a life-size effigy of Agnes. The effigy is of her lying her head on a large pillow. On her right hand, there are two rings and she is holding a rosary. At her feet are two small dogs. Agnes has been dead and gone for centuries now, but her memory and her story has lived on in Bavarian history. Today, the exact location of Agnes's grave is unknown. That is because in 1785, the church trustee Franz von Paula Romer had the tombstone moved to the wall of the chapel to keep it from receiving any further damage due to depredatory footsteps. But the chapel still became a tourist attraction. And as more and more people became interested in Agnes, the more stories that were told about her, and not all of them were completely, or really, at all, true. One story claims that Australian troops stole Agnes's remains. Another story states that Agnes and Albert were switched at birth, and Agnes was the daughter of Ernest, Duke of Bavaria, and Albert was the son of a poor barber surgeon. As Agnes's popularity grew, so did the desire to find her remains. In 1897, the Bernauer biographer Felix Josef Liprovsky had the grounds searched for Agnes's remains, but nothing was found. At least, no remains were found. What was found was a note. This note indicated that Agnes's remains had been moved to what used to be Nicholas Chapel, but had been converted into a sacristy in 1692, and the vault underneath the chapel had been filled. A sacristy is where a priest gets ready for service, and items of worship are kept. It is possible that that is where Agnes's final resting place is, but nothing is for certain. Even though no one knows for sure where Agnes is laid to rest, it still doesn't keep people from celebrating her. The Bavarian king Ludwig I visited Agnes for an hour chapel in 1812, and he wrote a poem about Agnes. He also made sure that the masses for Agnes and Albert were read again in the Carmelita church. There is also an annual memorial mass for Agnes that has been held since 1922 and the Bavarian government foots 100% of the bill. Josef Mikhail Neustifter erected the sculpture of Agnes Bernauer at Lutenberg Castle in 2013. And if you remember on last week's episode that I did about Jane Alice Kittler, I told you that Alice isn't the only person that I'm going to be covering this season that has a musical written about them. Well, as of 2017, there is a musical about Agnes titled Agnes or The Secret of the Blutenberg Castle. 
But that is not the only time Agnes's story has been played out on the stage. Many plays about Agnes's tragic story were written in the 19th century, including an opera by Kaya Off called Die Bernauen. And it's possible that you have eaten a dessert or played a game named after Agnes. There is an Agnes Bernauer tort and Agnes Bernauer solitaire. The rules to Agnes Bernauer solitaire are similar to regular solitaire, but there are some differences. I will leave a link to the recipe for the dessert and a link to the game underneath the sources in the episode description, in case you're interested. Many people have been compelled by Agnes's story and her star-crossed love and the injustice that was done to her. And now, I can count myself as one of them. And that was the life of Agnes for an hour. Thank you so much for listening to the third episode of the second season of History Shelf. There are 15 episodes planned for this season. Next week's episode is going to be about Gentili Bull Durioli. I hope you come back for that. A few things before I go. If you want to follow this podcast on social media, the Twitter for this podcast is at History Shelf Pod. The Instagram is at History underscore Shelf underscore Pod. And the Facebook page is History Shelf Podcast. If you want to support this podcast financially, you can do that by buying merch from the History Shelf merch store. There is a link to the History Shelf merch store on this podcast's Twitter page. The link is underneath the bio. I will also put a link to the merch store in the show notes for this episode. You can also support this podcast financially by becoming a Patreon. This podcast is always going to be free, but there are some perks that come along with becoming a Patreon. The first tier is called History Student, and that is $1 a month. With that, I will send you out a thank you tweet. The second tier is called History Fan. That is $3 a month. With that, you get the first tier. Plus, you get to vote in a poll that helps me choose the theme for the next season of this podcast. The third tier is called History Buff. That is $20 a month. With that, you get the first two tiers, plus you get a handwritten note of thanks mailed to you from me. And the last tier is called History Lover, and that is $40 a month. With that, you get the first three tiers, plus you get to choose one item from the merch store. There is a link to the Patreon on this podcast's Twitter page. I have pinned the link. I will also put a link to the Patreon in the show notes for this episode. But as always, the best way that you can support this podcast is to continue to listen to it. There are a few other ways that you can help support this podcast for free. One is to rate this podcast five stars if you are listening on a platform that lets you do that. Another is to share this podcast on social media. And another way is to tell your friends and family about this podcast. That would be very helpful. All right. Well, until next time, keep learning, keep loving history, and come back for next week's episode. Bye.